So where we are right now is making uh, appropriate decisions in the management of patients with metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. And the burden that we have is what's the best treatment for a patient with metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. So with all the agents out there, let's start with something like Cipulucil-T and talk about that a little bit. We know that Cipulucil-T uh, is effective. It's an effective drug. It was actually the first drug that was FDA approved in the development of medications for metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer almost five years ago now. It was a first in class autologous immunotherapy that really set the stage for much of the immunotherapy that we're gonna be hearing about the next couple of years. When you use Cipulucil T, you really have to use it in the earliest stages. Before patients become symptomatic, you can't use it when they have liver metastasis. You can't use it with visceral metastasis. It really has to be bone only, metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. When you actually look at the data, earlier is better. And there was very uh, retrospective, uh, very interesting retrospective work done by Paul Shellhammer uh, and associates looking at the original impact trial that was published uh, several years ago that led to the approval of Cipulucil-T, where if you looked at quartiles of PSA and you broke it down in, in approximate ranges of PSAs of less than 22, PSA 22 to 50, 50 to 134 and above 134, there was almost a stair-step progression in the survival increases using it for earlier PSA levels. And in fact, the most pronounced survivals, sometimes uh, on the average uh, going over 42, 44 months in that range, were for the patients who got Cipulucil T with a PSA of less than 22. Now, this is a retrospective analysis. This was not part of the original study. However, when you do look at it, it's very impressive, and it just drives the point home that if you're going to use Cipulucil T, use it early, use it before the PSA gets uh, significantly elevated. The other interesting thing about Cipulucil-T, and we, we currently have a paper under review for this, is that we actually think that Cipulucil-T works better than the IMPACT trial even suggested for one simple reason. Patients who progressed on Cipulucil-T and were on the trial and got the placebo were then eligible for a secondary treatment with the actual Cipulucil T. So a lot of patients who were in the control arm ultimately on the clinical trial were actually treated with a modified form of Cipulucil T because it was based on frozen cells. So that paper is currently under review. It's actually been presented at multiple national meetings. But again, that's another, another subtlety to reinforce the fact that immunotherapy and prostate cancer is real. There's really something going on, and again, it was really Cipulucil-T that sort of broke open that whole concept that prostate cancer could be treated with an immunotherapeutic approach. So when you're going to use Cipulucil-T, there are some logistical challenges with it. As we mentioned, it is a autologous immunotherapy, meaning that it's got to be the patient's own immune cells. So there are some challenges with actually getting it set up. The patients have to undergo leukophoresis. Their cells have to be packaged, sent to the processing plant, uh, exposed to the PAP GMCSF, and then the actual activated dendritic cells are returned to the site of the patient and infused into the patient. That cycle's repeated three times over about a one month period. So there are some logistical challenges, but the, the, uh, the manufacturers actually helped a lot with this and they've made a lot of the logistics uh, much easier for different, different sites. The big challenge right now is getting an appropriate uh, place for the leukophoresis that's convenient for both the provider and for the patient. And I think right now, if you ask me what the biggest challenges were with Cipulucil T, that's probably what it is, because there's probably not as many sites around the United States as we'd like to see that are able to do the initial leukophoresis to draw off the dendritic cells that can then be sent off for further processing. But again, the company is very good about setting this up, the logistics for the patient and the provider. So there's very good teaching materials for the patients to understand the logistics of Cipulucil T and uh, this new immunotherapy approach. Uh, they're well counseled about it. There's good videos online and there's good support uh, 
mechanisms made available to them, both by the providers and by the manufacturer of Cipulucil T. So patients understand it's a little bit of a chore, but they also understand that, again, it is an FDA-approved drug, and then used appropriately, it can give a significant advantage to patients. So when you talk about Cipulucil T therapy, the side effects are really very limited, and almost all the side effects are associated with the infusion. So using, um, using some uh, diphenhydramine, using some acetaminophen, and also counseling the patients that they might feel fever, chills, maybe a little nausea, a little malaise, not too dissimilar than patients sometimes get with immunizations because it is an immunotherapy. And again, it's the educated patient who really does the best with this, that understanding you may feel kind of yucky for 24 to 48 hours afterwards. So as long as the patients understand that, they usually are able to, uh, to deal with it. Hospitalizations, exceedingly rare. It can happen um, with patients who get dehydrated or just feel so badly they can't, they can't function, but extraordinarily rare to be hospitalized after this treatment.